So we are back on schedule now, um, and we will be saying good evening to Mike Baldwin and Lewis Jones across the pond in the UK. They want to speak to us live a little bit first, and then do their recorded presentation and then field questions at the end. Are you there, Mike and Lewis? We're here. Oh, very good. What would you like to say? Well, this is really just to say um, that Mike Baldwin and I are delighted to be with you today, this afternoon as it is for you, uh, speaking from London. And um, that uh, we, we've very slightly shifted the emphasis of our presentation in relation to the initial um, abstract, taking you very much back to the end of the 17th century and the very beginnings of the pedal harp, with perhaps slightly less emphasis upon the distribution and dissemination of the harp in the middle years of the 18th century. And I think the presentation speaks for itself, but we'll be delighted to consider questions and talk to you at the end. Thank you. Very good. Well, we can never have too many papers about harps, right? So let's, let's get with it. The invention of the pedal harp is widely, if not universally, attributed to the Donauwert harpist and instrument maker Jakob Hochbrücker. According to his son, Johann Baptist Hochbrücker, in the introduction to his Opus 2 collection of Select Ariette with accompaniments for the, for the harp, published in Paris in the 1760s, the date of, the date of invention of Hochbrücker's prototype was 1697. If, perhaps because the earliest dated pedal harp is Hochbrücker's of 1720, now in Vienna, we might be sceptical that the moment of invention had been 23 years earlier, we might find reassurance in the contemporaneous example of the pianoforte, invented by Bartolomeo Cristofori, likewise in the final years of the 17th century, of which the earliest extant example also dates from 1720. And, indeed, there are remarkable parallels to be found between the ensuing spread and wider adoption of the two instruments later in the 18th century. Four harps by Hopbrooker are known to survive, of which two are dated. The first, with 35 strings, dated 1720, is at the Kunsthistorisches Museum Vienna. The second, with 34 strings, dates from 1728 and is at Musée de la Musique Paris. The third and fourth undated instruments, one at Belle Reve Museum Zurich and the other newly acquired by the Musical Instrument Museum Phoenix, have 33 strings. We will briefly consider the sources on which Hochbrücker would have drawn in developing harps such as his of the 1720s in respect of material form, mechanism, musical resource, and so forth. Although there are frequent references in the literature to the pedal harp as a stage in the chromaticization of the harp, two row and three row harps, that's to say double and triple harps, had already afforded a fully chromatic scale for more than a century, but with restricted fluency of playing in keys other than that to which the outer diatonic rows of strings were tuned. The challenge for the harpist and the maker was to transpose the primary diatonic scale while allowing fluent modulation to several keys. Except for the much altered example in Vienna, the body of Hochbrücker's pedal harps of the 1720s stems not from the wide staved body of the large 17th century triple harp, for example, the shortened example in Bologna, the Barberini harp in Rome, and those depicted in painting by Carlo Francesco Nuvoloni and Domenico Zampieri. or indeed of double harps, but rather they stem from the Italian and South German tradition of relatively small, shallow-bodied single harps. For example, 
those in the Museum of Fine Arts, Boston, and the Castello Sforzesca, Milan, from which the 18th century German hook harps also derive. Their bodies are essentially rectangular in cross-section, made of four pieces of wood, the soundboard sometimes with an added centre strip. Setting aside the much earlier oval-sectioned late Renaissance single-row harps, their bodies carved from two conjoined pieces of wood, and the related double harps, for example the Este harp in the Museo Civico Modena and that in the Museo Civico Bologna, only the 18th century German Davidshafen among chromatic double row harps and hook harps among single row harps are immediately comparable to Hochbrückers in general proportions, size and compass. A striking feature of Hochbrücker's pedal harps is a relatively straight low neck. Examining changing neck shapes, we see seven main types. The earliest instruments from the beginning of the 18th century have what may be described as double concave necks, and these are followed by a hook harp by Hochbrücker, dated 1738, whose neck curve is reflex. Five Baroque style harps follow, comprising two hook harps and three doubles. Commonly called David's Harfen, they are typified by carved figures, scrolls and foliage on their necks and pierced sound holes in their sound boards. From the first to fifth instrument, the neck curves change from almost straight to S-shape, while the sound boxes continue to be rectangular in section. It is likely that Hochbrücker adopted the relatively straight neck for ease of accommodating and efficiency of operation of the linkages of his mechanism. Turning to the pedal instrument, writers have often claimed that harps with fewer than seven pedals, for example, two, four or five, preceded those with one pedal for each note of the diatonic scale. This is not necessarily so. There are no known Hochbrook instruments with fewer than seven pedals. Indeed, examination of the form, materials and techniques used to make pedal harps surviving from the first half of the 18th century indicates that they are later than those by Hochbrucker. Looking closely at Hochbrucker's pedal harps, we see that they all share features in common with their unmechanized predecessors. They have straight pillars, broadly rectangular section bodies, and between 33 and 35 strings. Considering the mechanism, Hochbrucker would have been familiar with the mechanical linkages, that's to say trackers, rollers, pull-downs and so forth, between the keys and pedals and the pallets of the organ. His ingenuity lay in adapting these with the objective of stopping all of the strings of a given degree of the diatonic scale in response to the depression of a single pedal. And, doubtless for reasons of economy, he preferred to communicate motion by means of wires operating under tension rather than rods operating under compression, which would have needed to be thicker. Although the early pedal harp is widely assumed to be a mechanised form of the hook harp, a harp with manually operated rotating hooks to stop individual strings, and that's an assumption which posits a beguilingly linear mechanical evolution, there seems to be a dearth of datable evidence, material or documentary, attesting to the existence of hook harps before 1697. We might recall that Juan Bermudo, referring to the playing of the harpist Ludovico in the Declaración de Instrumentos Musicales of 1555, Bermudo mentions the possibility of stopping a string with the fingertip we might speculate that Hochbrucker's spatulate brass tangents, or crutches, substituted not for a rotating wire hook, about whose currency at the time we are uncertain, but rather for the fingertip. In contradistinction to the U-shaped hook of the hook harp, which displaces 
and stops the string directly within a narrow range of possible points along its length, Hochbrucker's tangents displace the string laterally between the tuning pin and a fixed nut pin, such as the nut pin, not the tangent itself, defines the length of the vibrating length of the string. That Hochbrucker continued to acknowledge the simpler hook harp four decades after the reported date of, of invention of its pedal counterpart is shown by his only extant hook harp, with just two hooks per octave, which dates from 1738. The surviving Hochbrückers, except the 1720 in Vienna, which was adapted later, have external springs at the base of the harp to help the pedal action, and no pedal box. The mechanism trains return by the application of relatively simple leaf springs housed in the neck of the harp. Their mechanisms are refined and beautifully executed, suggested that they are mature iterations of the invention. It seems unlikely that all these features would have been present in so sophisticated a form in the 1697 prototype. We may situate Hochbrucker's design of the sound of his harps in relation to that of contemporary German counterparts, many of which, including hook harps and the two-row Davidshafen, continued well into the 18th century to have bray pins in the soundboard, producing a stridulation as they subtly interfered with the vibration of the strings. The student in Johann Philipp Eisel's Musicus Autodidactos of 1738, curious about how the strings are fastened into the instrument, is told, after the knots have been made, they are drawn into the holes drilled into the body or resonance, that's to say the soundboard, for this purpose and are securely kept there by the usual cartridges. He calls the pins patronen, the bray pins, which must be provided with a small cavity or crack so that the string is not damaged. In such a way, the cartridge is not pushed in so firmly, nor so easily, so that the string emits its buzzing tone. And finally, after other questions, the student asks, can't this harp, the David's harfer, also be voiced and used in a different way? That's to say, different from the way already described. And the author answers, yes. If you raise the bray pins, patronen, away from the strings, which otherwise cause the buzzing, it will emit a uniform and ringing, lute-like tone. Although Eisel thus shows that the braying sound was still the norm at the time, at least for the David's half, it was the clear lute-like sound, apparently less usual in Germany at the time, which Hochbrucker evidently favoured, since he didn't use bray pins. Although many hook harps also had brays, Hochbrucker's one surviving example the instrument of 1738, does not. Regarding stringing, the Davidshafer, according to Eisel, had gut strings like the violin and bass violin, Bassgeiger, progressing from the thinnest chanterelle lute string in the upper treble to the thickest low C string of the bass violin, the Bassgeiger, in the bass. And the thickness of the bold lines representing the lowest four strings, that's to say the notes G to C, in his figure, strongly suggests that all the strings, none of which needed to be stopped, were of plain gut. In the pedal harp, however, flexibility, allowing displacement of the string to stop it without undue sharpening of pitch, was important and a marked step in the line of Hochbrucker's nut pins along the neck of his instrument 
suggests that he envisaged the lowest six strings should be overwound with thin metal wire. Overwinding would also have helped compensate for the relatively short bass strings, that's to say, shorter than those of typical Davidshafen, resulting from Hochbrücker's use of a relatively low neck curve. In November 2019, we examined a harp by Hochbrücker, now at Musée de la Musique Paris, conserved and restored by Bert Wolf in 2006. Initially anonymous, the instrument was clearly the work of an accomplished craftsman, although the maker was unknown until 1997, when Bert examined a known Hochbrücker harp at the Kunsthistorische Museum Vienna. Both harps have machines of the same design and the same material. The adjustable crutches on both are of the same spatula shape and the neck and pillar cross sections are similar. Although the 1720 harp has been altered, both would originally have had the same type of pedal and communicating wires. Whilst dismantling the mechanism, Bayet found three signatures. The first, on the fifth link rod, reads G O Do 1728L, giving the instrument a date. Its placement suggests that it represents the maker of the mechanism, not of the harp. Bayet proposed that a watchmaker had made it, hinting at a collaboration between trades. The second signature, reading Blakey, was on the back of the first linkage, perhaps referring to a spring maker of that name. And the third appears to be a serial or lot number, reading Y28IISSI or, read differently, G2811351, the 28 perhaps corresponding to the 1728 date. We found that the harp's neck and pillar are made of sycamore. The pillar inlaid with ebony and chamfers on the neck painted black. The mechanism is covered with a thin plate of sycamore held in place with a pair of hooks. The tuning pins are of brass, unusually for the harp, where iron was commonly used. The body is of maple veneered poplar made in four curved staves. Two forming the back have an elegant S shape curved and their figured veneers are book matched. Though these techniques are unusual on the harp of this period, they are shared with instruments of the violin family. The top and bottom blocks are of pearwood. The soundboard consists of two vertically grained spruce boards, approximately two millimetres thick, joined an H-shaped poplar bridge, whose outer face is veneered in snakewood and decorated with ebony and maple fillets. The spruce soundboard is reinforced internally with horizontal willow ribs. The action applied to 28 of the 34 strings consists of cylindrical arbors around which linkages turn, transferring movement via short links to a series of trains. At the head of the harp, each train is attached to a leaf spring, whilst the treble end terminates in bell cranks from which the pedal wire passes through the sound box to the pedals at the bottom of the harp. The pedals are of forged iron. Their layouts different from that of later harps, being arranged from left to right, B, C, D, E, F, G, A. This layout matches that of the Hochbrucker harp in Zurich, while the Vienna harp shows the order as used on later French, English and modern instruments, this being D, C, B, E, F, G, A the B and the D being swapped. The harps of the late Baroque era were varied and complex. 18th century examples, when ordered chronologically, illustrate various forms highlighting change, which was not always simply linear over the century. In one example, with 33 strings and four pedals, which has been described as dating from the beginning of the 18th century, we see apparently a development of Hochbrucker's pedal system. The pedals are mounted inside the sound box, 
the bottom of which forms a rudimentary pedal box. The machine is similar to Hochbrucker's, but less refined and well made. The sound box, unlike other harps of the period, is staved, perhaps suggesting a later date. A second harp, apparently by the same maker, has five pedals, but the same pedal and mechanism arrangement and staved sound box. The head of the harp is decorated with a carved flower resembling the scroll commonly found on mid 18th century French pedal harps. Despite having fewer pedals, these instruments are clearly informed by and later than Hochbrucker's developments, perhaps from around 1750. We shouldn't see harps with fewer than seven pedals per octave, sometimes termed partial actions, as early or primitive attempts to mechanise the instrument, or as prototype stages leading towards seven pedals. Rather, they represent a deliberate choice, just as most of the hook harps discussed have fewer hooks than strings. We can conclude that the music for which such harps were intended required a narrower range of keys, and it is likely that the players would have retuned the harp according to the keys needed. Confirmation that these instruments are not partial actions, missing some pedals, can be found later in the 19th century, when harps of this type were still being made. Hochbrucker's invention a major technological and musical development was doubtless driven by the need to play in and modulate between a wider variety of keys without the constraints of the double and triple harps. Mike and Lewis back on. Do we, do we hear you, gentlemen? <coughs> Lewis, Mike? We hear you. Okay, good, we hear Can you, you hear too. you hear us? So, quest thank you very much. Uh, there was uh, thunderous applause for your uh, presentation. Um, questions for Mike or Lewis, or both? Uh, it's not a question, just, um, I just wanted to say if you want to have more material from Beard Wolf, it's in my office, <laughs> so we have the archive. Okay, did you hear that, Mike and Lewis? We did, yeah. Okay, um, we, we, we did, and I mean, I think we should... Yes? We'd just like to acknowledge that Beat has been tremendously generous in sharing, I think, probably a large part of the same material with us already, but that's very, uh, very generous of you to, to highlight that. Thank you very much. Great, great. Other questions? Perhaps not, but you know where to find uh, Mike and Lewis online. Thank you, gentlemen. It's, you can go to bed now um, or have dinner or whatever you're going to do. But um, thanks again. I'm sorry we couldn't be here in person. We'll look forward to seeing you at a future meeting. And so that concludes. We are uh, sorry about that too, but it's th thank you for the opportunity to present this. No. And if any questions do arrive, of course, we'd be delighted to hear from people. Thank you.